You're listening to 99.1 WQRTLP Indianapolis, and welcome to Radio Free Book Club. I'm Ken Honeywell. I'm a writer and reader from Indianapolis, and this is our first show. Today, we're going to be discussing Emily St. John Mandel's novel, Sea of Tranquility, and I'm joined in the studio today by three other club members whom I'd love to have introduce themselves. Craig, why don't we start with you? Hi, I'm Craig Von Dalen. I am a father, an architect, a real estate developer, and evidently I can now call myself a philanthropist, which is nice. Um, I've been uh, working here in the southeast side of downtown Indianapolis uh, um, in the Fletcher Place, Holy Rosary, and Fountain Square neighborhood as a landowner and property developer and uh, helping different organizations get started. Thanks, Craig. Tracy? I'm Tracy Kumbe, a marketing writer, bread baker, hiker, mulch mover, and kind of an education junkie. I also read a lot and make fun of my 17-year-old kid. He's a good one to make fun of. Thanks, Tracy. Steve? My name's Steve Woods, and I am married with three children. I am a financial advisor, uh, an avid reader, and I have a uh, side hustle. I am an NFL football official. Thanks, Steve Woods. I remember when Steve Woods was an Indiana high school football official Mm -hmm. many, many a moon ago. Uh, Well, thanks, everybody. We're glad you're here. And since this is our first show, I just wanted to give a little background about what we're doing and what uh, you can expect as a listener. So every month, we're going to choose a contemporary novel, usually something published, say, within the last year. And we're going to talk about it book club style. This is a book club where we will actually talk about the book. Might be a little different from some of the book clubs some of us have been in in the past. Um, But that's what we're going to do with this one. Um, Please also understand this is not a book review show where there will be spoilers and we're not going to interview authors. There are lots of uh, shows like that. In fact, Emily St. John Mandel has done a lot of interviews around this book, Um, but that is not what we're doing here. Um, As I said, there will be spoilers. We'll almost certainly talk about Uh, what happens at the end of the book. So if you don't want to know what happens, uh, now would be a good time to stop listening and come back after you've read the book, and and we hope you will. And so why are we doing this? Well, I guess I'll I'll speak for myself, Um, but it's because uh, I, and I think we, love reading, uh, and I think reading novels is important. There's a lot of research that suggests reading fiction makes you more open-minded, more empathetic, more compassionate. The Harvard Business Review, of all uh, publications, uh, everybody, says that research suggests that reading literary fiction is an effective way to enhance the brain's ability to keep an open mind while processing information, a necessary skill for effective decision-making. So see, there are good business reasons Mm -hmm. to be reading fiction as well. Um, But I I really think for me, stories, uh, fiction helps us see the world through other people's eyes in a way nothing else really can. You know, novels especially allow you to get deep into other people's minds. And I've had a lot of people say, well, those are just made up people. But I would say to that, it doesn't really matter because we really can't get into each other's heads and we um, and we are kind of unreliable narrators of our own lives, I think. And I think fiction is the closest we can actually get to understanding what it's like to be in somebody else's head. So that's why I'm doing it. Um, And um, and I hope I hope that uh, everybody out there. Um, will uh, come along with us. So with that, let's just dive in and talk about what's been a pretty popular book um, this spring and this summer, Emily St. John Mandel's Sea of Tranquility. And I'd love for someone to give us a quick synopsis of the book. Sure, sure. Uh, This is a novel that spans 500 years in just about 200 pages through a handful of lives that are connected by a paranormal experience in a forest. And we first experienced that through the eyes of an outcast in 1912, and eventually through one of the key players in the year 2401. This book is a mystery about what this paranormal experience might mean and how it originated. And it's a very suspenseful family drama across three families, 
I'd call it a work of speculative fiction that almost seems unconcerned with its own world building. And that paranormal experience is at the center of it. There's time travel, there are moon colonies, there's a plague, and all of that really is peripheral to what matters. The connections among the people, the range of our powers to affect each other, and the judgments we have to make about what matters. This is also the kind of book that as soon as I finished it, and I'll confess, I did not love it. I did not rush to the Kindle to get back into this. But as soon as it was done, I wanted to start it over again. And that's because it's super complicated and it gets wrapped up in what I think is a really elegant way. I wanted to get back and kind of see the scaffolding after I got through it. Mm. Yeah. I mean, Tracy, you're a, you're famously not a science fiction reader. This is true. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I think I, I agree with you. And I, I also was really interested in how it went together and also, uh, we'll say up front, didn't love everything about it. Um, but yeah, thanks. Um, I'm sorry. We, did we stop in the middle of that? Did you have more we to didn't. go? We didn't. I feel like that was it. But, yeah, but awesome. did that seem like what that book was to you? Yeah. I mean, I think that's, I think that was a really good um, synopsis. So yeah, let's. Uh, no. Yeah. I, I thought it was a good synopsis, but I, I'm a science fiction guy. So if I read books, it's more than likely that if I, I, it's a science fiction book and I should have done in my introduction is I'm not a reader and I'm doing this because I need to read more and it's like a good impetus for me to read awesome. more. Awesome. You're, so, you're exactly the audience we're looking for. Perfect. Craig. And, and, but I read this as a science fiction novel and I, I, I liked it. Um, so, um, I didn't find a lot of flaws in it, but what I, what I found was I would read it and I'd put it down for a day or two and then I'd pick it back up again and I'd start reading it and I'd go, Oh God, I got to go back 15 pages and figure out what was going on. Right. Cause it's very disjointed and the names are unusual and I'm not good with names. So I've got to go back and figure out, Oh, who's this Gasper guy? Why is he keep showing up? But, but the only thing I would say is, yeah, it's a, it, to me, it was a very, it was a very good science fiction novel. Mm. Yeah. I am not a science fiction fan, but I think to Tracy's point that uh, she uh, kind of in a sneaky way got us into this science fiction realm. Um, and I say sneaky because, and this is one of the things I wanted to maybe talk about later, was the technology of how they did this was never really discussed. It was just kind of understood. Um, you know, if, if we went back in time, nobody could explain how we use a cell phone. And she treated uh, the time machine just like that. Um, so I, I found that interesting and in how she just kind of sidestepped the entire conversation. And I think that would have added to the 200 pages if she tried to get into the science of it. But um, I did find that it was a page turner. Uh, a, a very good indication is if I'm thinking about it when I'm not reading it, if I'm excited to go to bed to read it. Um, and that kind of checked all the boxes. Like the two of you, I I left with some concerns where I didn't love it, love it. Um, but I really liked it. Yeah, I I think I I felt a lot the same, Steve. And I I have to say I was a big fan of Station Eleven. I know I know same here. Uh, yeah. And I know Steve, you have read Station Eleven too. And I know Craig, you just started watching the the very good yeah. HBO adaptation. It, it really is very good. I think um, not as not as good as the book. Um, not not really surprised there, but a really nice adaptation. Um, and I thought the Glass Hotel, her next novel, was fabulous. And um, there, there was a little bit I didn't like about that, and we could maybe get into that a little bit. But, um, and I, I know Tracy, you've read all three of those books. Steve, have you read The Glass Hotel? I'm reading it now. Oh, you're reading it yeah. now. Um, obviously, there are some overlaps uh, among all three of those books, really. There are recurring characters um, from, particularly from The Glass Hotel to um, Sea of Tranquility. Um, and what, would you, do you, do you remember those overlaps, Tracy? Do you remember who those characters were? Sure. We had, I mean, I don't think I can give you a book report on them, but we have Vincent who was in the glass hotel, who was, I believe the wife of a Bernie Madoff style scammer. Right. Jonathan Alkaitis or Alkaitis. 
and her brother. Yeah, her brother Paul, who was the musician. And and characters, you know, played a pretty significant role. These characters from the Glass Hotel, um, particularly Marilla, who was uh, Vincent's friend in the Glass Hotel. Um, but I think, you know, some of those some of those themes uh, that carry through. I think it's interesting that um, so many of Emily St. John Mandel's principal characters are displaced people. And I think that was true in those other two novels, but also in this one. You know, with, you know, Edwin, um, you know, basically being kicked out of the family. Right. And, and uh, then um, Gaspari kicked out of time, really. Right. It's taking it to a whole new level. And I thought really that bringing in the characters from the other novel is a nice way of underscoring this point that everything is fluid and we don't know what's real. Yeah, it's also interesting that, you know, I think also consistent with this book, um, some of the, the characters' fates in the Glass Hotel were not the same as their fates in Sea of Tranquility. For example, um, Vincent's husband, Jonathan, went to prison in the Glass Hotel. In Sea of Tranquility, he fled the country and uh, went to... Dubai. I, went to yeah, Dubai. Dubai. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, so it's kind of like all of her works exist in a multiverse. Right. Yeah. That's a great point. So someone may have gone back and futzed with the timeline a little in the same way that Gaspar is doing. I had not thought of that, but what an interesting thought. I mean, that point couldn't have been lost on the author that his fate was different in each of those books. So right. that does make for an interesting twist. Well, and there are, there are also characters in Station Eleven who appear in the Glass Hotel, much more minor characters. Actually, uh, Miranda, who was the creator of the comic book, Station Eleven, um, she has a role in the Glass Hotel. Um, but it, interesting. anyway, um, just kind of to move along, we're talking about Sea of Tranquility. Um, so is there anything y'all thought worked particularly well or didn't work particularly well, Craig? What do you, Can, anything come to mind? Well, one I think I'd go back to, and this goes back to it being a science fiction novel, and you guys mentioned how it was a short science fiction novel, and it referred to all these different technological things, like the fact that there was a colony on the moon, there was a colony on Titan, um, there were colonies that were in Alpha Centauri, and as a guy who, I'm very interested in the concept of, of traveling through space and how long it takes and also the technology necessary in order to do that, it was actually really accurate. Um, I, I was reading it, and as a person who's very interested in that type of stuff and has done, like, how long would it take to get to Alpha and Centauri and what would it take to create a colony there? I've actually thought about these things myself because that's something I'm very interested in. I could not find any holes in her story. She actually has done quite a bit of research into how this could potentially evolve over time. And also, like, the keeping of the concept of the technology of the telephone or the device that you would have. I thought that was really interesting, too, because I feel like, you know, being that it was introduced to us only recently in our society, um, it's definitely got staying power that's going to continue with us for a very a considerable period of time. And so from a like from a technical standpoint, I can tell she really did her research. Um, like when she talked about the colonies on the moon, there had to be some machine that created Earth gravity on the moon in order for people to survive there appropriately. Um, one of the things I've realized as I start studying interstellar travel, and this is just kind of one of my hobbies and interests, is gravity is the single most important thing for human life. I mean, we can we can recreate a lot of other things, but without gravity, we're pretty much in big trouble. And Earth gravity is what makes us what we are. 
Um, but she like thought about all of this stuff and and put it into the novel in the technical standpoint, but still managed to keep it under two hundred words or two hundred pages. Um, I thought I thought it was really very elegantly researched and and pretty well put together from that standpoint. Uh, I'm still a little mixed up on the time stuff because I'm trying to decide. So what happened first? Because Gaspari didn't play the violin until he was really late later on in his life, and yet that piece was instrumental from the very beginning of the novel so from a time standpoint i'm a little twisted up and trying to figure it out but uh it was to me very elegantly and technically put together from that standpoint from the, the rest for the rest of the information it's so funny that you latch on to that stuff because i just couldn't care less about those elements of a book mm. and or this book but one of the things that i thought was so cool is they build this colony on the moon and the lights go out and everyone just goes, eh. Yeah, just they didn't have like the, this. Yeah, they didn't have the money to to repl- re, to make it work again. And as a guy who develops real estate, I can I just went, <laughs> yep, that could be, <laughs> that could happen. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was kind of a really cool touch. I mean, it's not that. I mean, there have been other science fiction worlds where things get shabby after a time, but just that whole idea of, yeah, you know, this is not such a nice neighborhood anymore. <laughs> so uh, let's was pick up and move to. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, then they they did Colony Three and they didn't have that problem. Yeah. <laughs> so Colony Two still existed, but the people that lived there just couldn't afford to live in Colony One or Colony Three. Um, that's yeah, very interesting. Um, yeah, I thought the um, I thought some of the I actually thought some of the science fictional elements were a little clumsy. Not that they weren't. Not that some of those things, as you said, Craig, weren't well researched. But I think some of them felt to me like an author who has not read a lot of science fiction, just throwing some stuff in like robot farms. And um, I think I think there was, to me, there was a little bit too much uh, emphasis on the hollow verse. I mean, that seemed like, like everyone using holograms seemed like it was like straight out of 1975 to me. Hmm. Um, but I, but I, um, yeah, Steve, any thought about that? I, I think you uh you know, it's interesting if if you're looking at it through that lens, you're going to read a different book, right? Oh yeah. Um for me, I just kind of accepted it and I didn't really give it much thought. It was plausible and like I said earlier, she didn't really have to go into any explanation. This simply is what it is. They have robot farmers. Okay. Um they have hovercrafts, they have holograms like a, you know, I, I can visualize what that looked like as she's in a room of other authors. And, you know, in 40 years, maybe we could do this virtually yeah. instead of all having to be together. So I didn't really get hung up on that and nor did it really distract me. I, I just kind of accept that in that whole kind of suspension of disbelief, although I think it's plausible. And I, I think that that's not too much of a stretch moving, uh, you know, 100 or 300 years into the future. Well, if it wasn't to me, I'm sort of obsessive compulsive about that kind of stuff. And if it wasn't like plausible in my mind, based upon the research that I've done, it would have fallen apart. So it, the fact that she did the research and actually everything she had in there seemed to and, and obviously I'm not a physicist, but. To, to me, it seemed very plausible based upon all the research that I've done in the past. And I think that's really important because I would have been, had it been like something goofy, I would have gone, eh, yeah. I'm not so interested anymore. Yeah. Well, um, there, there's a big element of the story that I'm really of two minds about, and that is the whole book tour. I think it is ludicrous to imagine that in the year, whatever it is in the future, there are going to be still a bunch of bookstores on Earth and authors coming from the moon to do book tours. I'm I'm sad to say that. At the same time, I think some of that was like among the most delightful stuff in the book that was that really was, you know, it was autofiction. I mean, some of that stuff, you know, is stuff that she has been experiencing as an author who wrote a book about a pandemic on the eve of a pandemic. Like the interaction with her drivers and so forth. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't, dis, I disagree with you, Ken. I think that that type of uh, publicity t- tour for any type of media is going to exist for a very long time. Um, 
and I don't, I, I don't, I hope bookstores don't go away. Well, I do too. I just don't, I just wasn't buying it. Well, yeah. and especially since we learned that she could have been doing it holographically. Exactly. Why go to the expense, right? Yeah, but holographically, I mean, it's just like during the pandemic, live music is still a lot more interesting and and to me more I'd, I'd much rather go watch live music or see somebody in person than turn on a, a computer and watch them so i think there's something there's a dynamic there that's very human that's i think very important as well and i think it still taps into the fact that we want to meet these people it's exciting to meet someone that has uh, written a book that you really like and just to go and ask questions or, uh, you know, at one point in the book, the, there's a woman that just kind of throws her hands up and is frustrated with the way um, Marion Bad ended. Um, so I, I think that we're always going to want that personal touch. So that wasn't all that much. But Ken, I would also ask, um, you know, do you own any records? You mean like uh, you, LPs? Yeah. Sure. So, I mean, that kind of contradicts a little bit yeah. back. I mean, we, we have such better sound quality now. Um, well, now as a record guy, I would say that's not necessarily true. But it's still that kind of throwback, I think. Right. And we, we have some, uh, you know, if you tap into that nostalgia, um, I think there's something romantic about it. And having the opportunity to go and, and sit in front of someone who you admire is going to transcend um, kind of time, I think, I hope. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not objecting to the, I, I mean, I would, I think that would be awesome, uh, if there are still book tours and bookshops all over the broken up United States, uh, in the future into a bunch of different countries, United Carolina. And, <laughs> uh, I forget what they all were. But, um, yeah, I hope that happens. I'm just not sure that I'm buying it. <laughs> the city, you know, state of Los Angeles, sorry. <laughs> a, lot of, a lot has been made of this autofiction element. And typically, I would say, who cares? It's not really our business how much of the fiction is real life. But I think in this instance, it's an especially cheeky element that ties into the whole what's real and what's not element of the book overall the um you know is it a simulation is this an author toying with us etc yeah i i i don't disagree with you and i and i loved a lot of it i mean i loved a lot of the interaction with the you know uh someone who was interviewing her and ask her how many she'd sold and she apologized for not having brought her royalty statements to the interview <laughs> um you know so much of that just actually happened on her mm. book tour um but um i also I want to say I loved probably one of my favorite parts of the book was when she was in the hollow verse during the pandemic talking about uh, post-apocalyptic fiction and the popularity of post-apocalyptic fiction. You know, she's in her future world, you know, over the last 10 years or so, but which, of course, is analogous to today. You know, there's been post-apocalyptic fiction has been really popular. And she had a bunch of interesting thoughts about that. Yeah, I, I made some notes. I wanted to just read a couple of those passages. One was, perhaps we believe on some level that if the world were to end and be remade, if some unthinkable ca catastrophe were to occur, then perhaps we might be remade too, perhaps into better, more heroic, more honorable people. And she also writes, I think that, and this is in a part where she's talking on her book, book tour, I think that as a species, we have a desire to believe we're living at the climax of the story. It's a kind of narcissism. We want to believe we're uniquely important, that we're living in the end of history, that now, after all these millennia of false alarms, now is finally the worst it's ever been, that finally we've reached the end of the world. But what if... It always is the end of the world. This is the mind scrambler. Because right. we might reasonably think of the end of the world as a continuous and never ending process, which is an oxymoron, but I think spot on. Yeah, that's really think prescient. It's catastrophic. Right. Yeah. 
that explains basically. I, I, I hate this whole post-apocalyptic like n- movies and books thing that we're in because I'm a like a very optimistic person. But that passage explains the reasoning behind it better than anything I've ever heard. Um, what do you mean? That that like that, that it's like we f- we f- as a society feel like we're at the pinnacle now, so it can only be downhill from this point. And I, I, I think that's really one, one of the reasons that, that when you describe what you said in that quote from her, that's one of the reasons why post-apocalyptic um, literature and movies and everything are so popular. Because people think, well, it can't get any better than this, so it has to only get worse. And the end is now because it, this is the, the, the pinnacle of, of, our, of our society. And I don't think it is, frankly. I think that things are only going to continue to get better. There's going to be hiccups and slowdowns and things are going to go badly periodically. But I got to believe that it's just going to get better over time. I think I think it's all ending. And I think that's sort of the message of this book. Uh, who, yeah, but it's been bending, ending for the last 3,000 years. No, exactly. In the, <laughs> yeah. I think an important point is that we're just a blip. We're nothing. So this life that might feel long is in terms of space and time just nothing yeah and so gaspery who ended up in prison and he was saying um all stars burn out was that the line Mm -hmm. and interestingly enough his cellmate when he when he writes that looks at it optimistically nothing you know nothing lasts forever so being in prison won't last forever well and by the way that cellmate was jonathan alcatus's cellmate in the glass hotel Hmm. holy cow right equally as positive uh i don't i don't remember exactly he was an interesting character i mean i i remembered i had to go wait a minute i remember that guy and just go back and make sure that i was that he Hmm. was in that yeah um yeah, I think I want to I want to come back to um, one of your comments, Tracy. But I also want to ask: Is it the other thing? One of the other things she said is that post-apocalyptic literature is popular because we all secretly wish for a world with less technology. Any any reaction to that? That kind of ra- that kind of felt kind of true to me. Oh, I I, I would agree with that. I'm tired of it. I don't, I don't want this thing with me all the time anymore. I love my technology. I, I, I don't. <laughs> I love it. I want it. I need I, it. I, my I best time it. in the, in, in, of the day is when I get up in the morning and I leave this by my bed and I go out on my terrace and I sit there for 15 or 20 minutes and I don't even think about that. Um, I, I think the reality is we all want that, but none of us are willing to give it up. That's probably and it. And you talk to someone that's been on a vacation, like, oh, it's great. You know, I didn't look at my phone at all. I didn't have any worries. And um, But at the end of the day, uh, these are literally on some people's hips, right? Um, and we are tethered to technology from how I got to this place with my IMAP app and, um, and um, talking on the phone as I was hands-free, driving in the car. Um, I I think we do want that. And I think, to her point, maybe the only way we get there is with something awful happening. To return us to something that was once better. And and maybe that's the point. If we're at this pinnacle, uh, I think historically we all look back to the good old days and when things were easier. And, And my kids, you know, when we were kids, we just had to be at home when the lights turned on and now you've got parents with the 360 app that can pinpoint the location of your child at, at any moment. Um, does that make us better parents than, than our parents were? Probably not. Makes you different parents. Yeah, for sure. So, I don't have 360 by the way. <laughs> so, um, Tracy, I want to come back to that thought about we might reasonably think the end of the world Think of the end of the world as a continuous and never-ending process. I think that's such an interesting thought. And it really struck me in this book for the first time when, um, when Edwin was back in England after the war, after he'd been in World War I, and was talking with his mother, or there was a reflection about his mother um, who 
no longer her face lit up when she talked about the Raj. And he realized that that world was gone. And I th- and I, that's continued to strike me just kind of over and over again how um, how how things just continually end. Like the world I grew up in. I mean, I grew up in the. I'm younger than all of you guys. I grew up in the '60s and the '70s, and that world that world is gone. Um, I just think that's a really interesting thought. It struck me more than once just in reading other things that that's it happens continually. Was that addressed to anybody? In that's not addressed to anyone in particular, okay. but if Go anybody ahead. wants to so, say anything. Uh, that's a process that's been going on in human society for like 20,000 years. I mean, the, the, the Romans would dig up the antiquities of the Etruscans and go, wow, these people had indoor plumbing 2,000 years ago. We dig up the Romans' um, ruins and go, wow, these people had indoor plumbing 2,000 years ago. So it's just a constant, like we have societies get become prevalent and, and grow and then and develop technology. Um, the Greeks had computers. They found one in the Mediterranean, um, uh, um, the Mediterranean Sea about 70 years ago. They're still trying to understand it. Um, these things happen and then they, so societies grow up, they die, they grow up, they die. It's just an unending process. Um, that's why like we, t- the, the end is a process and we may be in the big be- in the beginning of the end, but they were probably in the beginning of the end 4,000 years ago when the Etruscans were, were the society of our, of our planet. So it's just a ongoing process. Yeah. Which makes her point. All the more. Oh, yeah. And we're a blip. Yeah, yeah. Then you think about like there are 150 million star systems in the solar system that we're in, the Milky Way. There are 500 million solar systems like the Milky Way. That's a lot. <laughs> and they're every, you know, we can't even, to travel to the nearest star that's near, which she mentioned the colonies of Alpha Centauri, takes, it's 4.3 million light years away. It would probably take us at speeds that we can actually understand 50 to 60 years to get there. That's just the nearest star to us. We can't even fathom the concept of going to another galaxy, which is millions of light years away. I mean, this we are like literally nothing, both in the timeline of the Earth, but also in the, the universe that we actually exist in. It's, it's amazing how we have huge egos, but we're really nothing in, in, the, in the grand scheme of things. Well, let's talk about that existence for a minute or lack of existence. Um, uh, There's a it's postulated in this book. It's a big part of the story that perhaps we're living in a simulation. Is there anything in the story that you think, I mean, really examined objectively, you think should convince characters that they were living in a simulation? And are we living in a simulation? And does it matter if we are? Well, it, I'm sorry. I'm going to inject again. I apologize. But uh, the the reality is, if you look at most religions, they would say that the human body is just a vessel for either the soul or the consciousness or anything like that. So we very well may be living in a, in a simulation, even within the context of our understanding it from a religion and philosophical standpoint. Um, but I will say this, the math of that type of simulation is a math that we have yet to get even close to fathoming. Yeah, but I mean, is that, I mean, obviously there, you know, the story centers around the anomaly and we know ultimately what happened, what the anomaly was. The anomaly was Gaspery. Um, But does that mean we're living in a simulation or is that, you know, possibly just evidence of the nonlinearity of time? I, I go ahead, Tracy. Is this one of those things that makes people read science fiction? Because I can't even stand to think about this. I mean, I'm here. I have headphones on. It feels real. That's good enough. Yeah, right. And I think that's what... That's my question. Right. Got to. right. Does it really matter if we are? Yeah, I would say no. I don't know, Steve. What were you going to say? I was just going to say it reminded me of a couple things. One, uh, I, I think I had read in college about Wittgenstein with his brains in a vat theory. And uh, if, if we get fact check, forgive me, but I think that he had said something to the effect of, if you can question your consciousness, it's not a simulation. 
because a simulation wouldn't allow that type of questioning. Now that you think about The Matrix, which is another um, franchise that, that delves into the simulation, and, and those characters at the beginning were literally in a vat of you know that gel that Neo came out of. Uh, Morpheus would just have said that part of his questioning was baked into the simulation. So it it really uh, can be explained away on both sides. And I heard uh, the author talk in a podcast about how she's read very intelligent people that can argue both sides. So, um, you know, for me, it didn't really um, hit like it was a simulation. I just didn't. I just didn't buy that. Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, I would guess ultimately I don't even think it matters to the story. I'm not even sure. I'm not even sure it was worth even bringing into the story. I think the time travel and the anomaly was enough and the way it got wrapped up was probably enough. Totally agree. Yeah, the author the author brought it in. I mean, yeah. she she basically. But I think that the concept would be that it would be a lot more subtle than than the Matrix concept of you're in a vat and they just create a world for you to live in. It seems like it's a lot more like um, the twenty one grams thing of that you've got something inside of you that is not attached to your body that when you die it goes somewhere else. So and then that that's the simulation concept of where does it go. And then what happens and what the, is this just a simulation that's been created by a, mar, a far more intelligent entity that we occupy? Um, I think her concept is far more like deep than than the vat of the than the matrix matrix concept. Um, but you know what was so great for me in this book? There's all this time travel and there's Gaspari stressing out about whether he is going to intervene or not intervene and taking action. And in in one case, he does have an effect by intervening. And in another case, all he does is change a person's time of death by about 48 hours. Right. But I get here's what I want to know about that, Tracy. Why did he because the war really screwed up Edwin. He knew we knew that was going to happen. Gaspari knew that was going to happen. Why did he not go back even further and tell Edwin not to go to war? I mean, if he was really going to affect people's lives like he did Olives for a reason, I, I think ultimately what bugged me the most about the book was it seemed too easy for him to just kind of, you know, decide he was going to save Olive's life. And then there really weren't repercussions for that. He had been warned endlessly about the repercussions of futzing with the timeline. And then he did it and he basically got a slap on the wrist and got sent back out again. Yeah, he did it just too easily, I thought. I just I just didn't buy it. I mean, I, I guess that's a question. Could you, could, could anyone in this room, uh, you know, resist messing with the timeline messing i mean absolutely not you couldn't oh, resist would, doing it yeah. no i would be tinkering left and right that's Definitely. what I, that's what i loved about gaspari is he's like i can't and, and it was almost like a setup where he did this on purpose because he knew he was going to go back and play with it because he he's like i can't let somebody die that I'm going to meet for that could, that I could save that. And I, I like that about his character. He's willing to do that. I think with the, with the poor gentleman from England, he would have had to go to war regardless because he was a British citizen during world war one, but he just he didn't could have wa- stayed in Canada. Yeah. <laughs> no, well, yeah, but yeah, he, he didn't want him to, to die depressed. He wanted him to, he knew he was going to die, but not depressed and not in such a horrible state. Yeah. Well, why do you think it was so hard to find people who wanted to time travel? That was one thing that was kind of bugging me was like, wouldn't you want to time travel? Because well, they had to find people that wouldn't tinker. <laughs> I mean, because all of us said, well, I would go back and fix something. Yeah, you know? I thought it was clumsy that uh, that the one guy um, who recruited, who was, what was the guy's name who recruited Gaspari? Yeah, I don't um, Ephraim. Ephraim. Yeah. That he had a quota. He was behind in his quota. That's why, you know, he embraced <laughs> Gaspari. Well, that's why they fast-tracked him. 
Right. right. They fast tracked him, but the fast track was like five years. Right. Right. Wasn't this an interesting enough problem that they had someone who like could go like next week? And you've got this institutions, time institute that is shrouded in secrecy and this kind of bumbling uh, security uh, worker at a hotel gets his way into this and suddenly becomes an agent of change. That part was a little um, frustrating for me. I just didn't buy the fact that just because he really wanted to, that he could do it. I mean, maybe he knew too much and that's why they let him in or because Ephraim needed to hit his quota. Well, plus he also had that time traveling cat that his sister gave him. I think Zoe planned it from the very beginning. That you you might I think I think it was her plan. For, she she even says in the book she was the best. She was the one right. person that I think she planned the whole thing from the very beginning to save Llewellyn. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, but by the way, that brings up the biggest problem I had with this book was time travel. I hate time travel. <laughs> it's I it's so messy. You'd love it. <laughs> oh, I, I love science fiction, but time travel gets so messy. It does get messy, but I think she did a pretty good job of wrapping everything up with the exception of one thing. I don't know why uh, Morella had to be involved at the murder scene in Ohio. That did not make even a little bit of sense to me. Uh, You know, they could have completely avoided that weirdness. Right. That was like just that extra dash of salt. Like, no, too much, too far. Right. So... So I have one last question, uh, and then um, we're going to have to kind of close. And that's, you know, at the end, Gaspari is thinking about time. He's in his new life. He's realized that he is the anomaly. Um, And the last line is um, he's thinking about being a still point in a ceaseless rush. Is that what do you think about that as the ending of the book? And is that a fitting ending? What does that mean to you? Is it the maturity that he has now come out on the other side and realizes that that's the only kind of explanation uh, to, to what he's experienced? Because basically he went through time and kind of screwed up a bunch of stuff. I, I right. kind of thought about uh, I've always hated Curious George and he created his own problem and then solves it. And at the end uh, comes out with this, um, you know, kind of understanding of what time and his place in it is all about. But um, he made his own bed with all of that. And, and that part is a little frustrating. I thought in in reading it. And I, I just kind of thought of curious George in that respect. Honestly, this book has so much movement in it from moon to earth and century to century that getting to the end with a line about stillness was very confusing to me. I really don't know what to make of that. Yeah. Craig, any thought? Super aspirational. (laughs) That's where I want to be. I mean, at my point in my life right now, that's where I want want to be a still point. Yeah. just hang out. Hopefully my kids come to me for advice. Yeah. Well, I'm supposed to be retiring. And so you would think that would be, um, yeah, I, I, that's a very attractive idea to me. So just, uh, what do you guys think? Good book? Recommend it? Think others should read it? Tracy? I would, I would point people to Station Eleven first. I, I, that book is so compelling and has really stuck with me. And this one, I think probably after I leave here, I won't think about again. Yeah. Craig, what do you think? I liked it. I mean, I'm, I, I found it. Um, I didn't know what to think when I started, cause I started reading. I'm like, this is really disjointed and confusing. But as I started getting into it and start and the story started coming together, I started to really like it. And I mean, I, I literally read the last, the half of the book and probably a day or two days. Yeah. So I, I, I started to enjoy it. Yeah. Steve Woods, what do you think? I think a, a beach read. 
I yeah. think it, it's, it's yeah. a page turner. Uh, it keeps your attention. It's it's not very long, and you can rip through it, and and you know you come up with some questions whether you like it or not, and it's thought provoking. Yeah. Yeah, I, and I'll I'll just say I agree with Tracy. I I would suggest if you're going to read it, read Station Eleven, and then read The Glass Hotel, and then read this. That's probably um, that's probably the best. And those novels go in descending quality for me. I think Station Eleven is great, and I think The Glass Hotel is really really good. And this one was a fun read. Okay, well before we go, uh, let's do a quick round of recommendations. What else are you reading, and what else? Um, what would you recommend, uh, Craig Von Dalen? <laughs> I'm not the reader, but I have been reading a lot of books on um, social equity, um, and I find them very interesting. And basically, the history of race relations in the United States of America. And, um, m- not, not. It's very like intellectual things, but but not. Uh, not not entertaining as far as like what i like to read when it comes to science fiction i really enjoyed when i was younger and i still do the works from from isaac asimov um i think his work is is pretty fantastic unfortunately very difficult to translate into uh um, a more popular medium, which is uh, movies and television. Yeah, I know Apple made uh, yeah, it was terrible. Foundation. I didn't yeah, it was, watch it. it. Was yeah. Terrible. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, but yeah, I, I'm kind of looking forward to hopefully you give us another book to read because it gives me something to do. Yeah. Laurel gives me books all the time and I read. Yeah. Good for Laurel. Yeah. So Tracy Kumbe, what do you got? Listen, the best thing happened last week. Somebody sent me a poem, by a poet I'd never heard of. I don't actually read a ton of poetry, but It's Ada Limon, Hmm. and she has several collections. I have read so far one called Bright Dead Things, and her latest is The Hurting Kind, which I'm reading now. And these poems, man, she has a very sharp and dark outlook, I think. And these poems are her through that looking for beauty. And it's the, it's just the coolest. They they get right into my gut. Yeah, awesome. That sounds great, Steve Woods. I think um, I always love sharing uh, recommendations because I think it it carries a lot of weight. So you've got to if you're going to make a recommendation, you're going to get judged on this. Um, and this is also one of my favorite questions to ask smart people because that's a great way to find books. Um, but I would stake my life on Amar Toll's The Lincoln Highways. That's probably the the book that I've been recommending the most and Gentlemen in Moscow was also very, very good. But The Lincoln Highways was uh, the last great book that I read that I really enjoyed. Yeah, great recommendation. Um, well, I for myself, this all this talk about post-apocalyptic novels made me think of a book um, that I I have cited frequently as my favorite novel of all time, and that is John Crowley's slim little novel called Engine Summer. It was published in 1979, and it's a really beautiful kind of pastoral post-apocalyptic world. Kind of I like you know, kind of maybe you know, per our discussion, that kind of world that we might hope for if we want to blow things up and see if we can become better people. Um, it, it's really it's really a beautiful book. It's kind of about a boy who goes on a quest to find a lost love and maybe discover the secrets of the angels, which is how these people refer to whoever came before them and left all these artifacts that they just don't know what they are, like in the book. Um, the boy's father, uh, they find something that is called road and the boy asks what it was for. And the father says to kill people. Hmm. So it's just, it's beautifully written. John Crowley is just a beautiful stylist and I, I just love his writing and the book can be a little hard to find. It's most probably most readily available in a, in a compilation of three novels by John Crowley with a, a couple of his other novels. But yeah, Engine Summer uh, is really a beautiful haunting book. And if you like post-apocalyptic fiction at all, I would, I would really recommend it. Craig Von Dalen. <laughs> And, Interesting that the road is a thing. To, I mean, that's what the Romans developed roads for was to move their armies. So you're, he was right. Yeah. 
Um, well, thanks, everybody. Uh, this has been really fun. Um, that's it for our first edition of Radio Free Book Club. Um, thanks to Craig Von Dalen, Tracy Kumbe, Steve Woods, and I'm Ken Honeywell. And we hope you'll join us again next month uh, when we're going to discuss another of this year's big novels, uh, Jennifer Egan's The Candy House. <gasps> oh, my gosh. I can't wait. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Look for us. Uh, we're going to have a blog on Medium. So look for Radio Free Book Club on Medium. Um, and thanks to our friends at WQRT uh, for uh, letting us do this. Uh, so we'll see you next month. And until then, go read a book. <laughs>